Coming up on Great Lakes Now. Citizen Science. The night sky can be mesmerizing, but for many of us, the stars are disappearing. The only stars that you can possibly see are the very brightest ones. Citizen scientists are helping to chart the changes. Counting up insect larvae to measure the health of our waterways. A lot of people that really care about the river and want to do whatever they can. And science projects around the Great Lakes. Hello oh, and welcome to the Great Lakes Now Facebook and YouTube Live episode sneak peek watch party for our March episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Anna Seisling, a producer with Great Lakes Now. So great to have you along. I also want to welcome our other watch party co-hosts who are streaming this event. And we've got a really great lineup of guests who are going to be joining us a little bit later in the watch party. And they are going to answer all of your questions about all things related to citizen science. In case you don't know, April is Citizen Science Month. And to prepare ahead of that, we decided to dedicate our entire Great Lakes Now March episode to citizen science. So the episode is called Fading Stars and River Bugs. And once you see the whole episode, you'll understand where the title came from. Uh, really, all of the stories, they feature the variety of ways that regular people are getting involved in citizen science. And as always, I'm really excited to bring your voice into the conversation tonight. So please let us know your name, where you're watching from. And if you've participated in citizen science through an app, a website, or maybe a local organization in your community, I'll be sure to work your questions and comments into the conversation as we go. So be sure to drop those into the chat. But before we get into any of that, let's check out a segment featuring a really cool citizen science project called Globe at Night. As I stand here in the snow, April is only a few days away. And April is Citizen Science Month. So for this episode, Great Lakes Now is partnering with SciStarter to bring you stories about citizen science projects. Up first, a global effort to map and track how the night sky is changing. About 40 miles west of Kenosha, Wisconsin, on the shores of Geneva Lake, sits the Yerkes Observatory. Built in 1897 and once operated by the University of Chicago, the observatory is legendary in the world of astronomy. So this is the last of a great style, and it remains the largest refracting telescope in the world. That's Walt Chaddock, Director of Programs and External Affairs at the Yerkes Observatory. The massive 63-foot telescope, weighing 160,000 pounds, is supported by an enormous chunk of concrete. The huge wooden floor of the observatory dome is really an elevator that goes up and down so astronomers can access the viewfinder. And I never get tired of watching people walk up that grand staircase and walk in this magnificent dome, look up at the great refractor, and just be riddled with goosebumps. But why did the University of Chicago build this huge observatory about 100 miles north of campus? It's because even in the late 1800s, light pollution was already becoming a problem for astronomers. This is the burgeoning city light culture in Chicago. You know, Edison was bringing city lights. So seeing, as astronomers call it, was getting increasingly more difficult in Chicago. In 1893, the world's Columbian Exposition opened in Chicago. It was kind of a coming out party for electric power and gave visitors a glimpse of the bright lights that would come to define modern cities. Of course, over the last century or so, we've installed a lot of electric lights. It isn't surprising that we put our most powerful, sophisticated telescopes above the glow in outer space. To see the night sky the way our great-great-grandparents would have seen it, you have to get pretty remote. I was canoeing in the Quetico Provincial Park, which is, are the boundary waters just above Minnesota. And we're out there on the 4th of July, and we had our own personal fireworks in the night sky. It was an amazing white curtain of flickering lights. Yeah, that was the Northern Lights. 
That's Connie Walker, an astronomer, recalling her first experience with the Northern Lights. She says it was inspiring. Today, Walker is a scientist at the National Science Foundation's NOIR Lab. NOIR Lab stands for National Optical Infrared Astronomy Research Laboratory. Long title. NOIR Lab operates three state-of-the-art ground-based observatories in Hawaii, Chile, and here in Arizona, just south of Tucson. One thing they study the increasing difficulty of seeing the stars from the Earth's surface. In some places, it's nearly impossible. If you go to like New York City, you will only see a handful of stars because of this glow that you, it's like washing out the night sky. So the only stars that you can possibly see are the very brightest ones. To track light pollution, Noir Lab relies on a worldwide network of citizen scientists through a project Walker runs called Globe at Night. We ask them to go outside at night and you know they bring up the app on their telephone and they get their eyes adjusted to the dark and what you're looking for are the faintest stars you can possibly see because that is basically your litmus test. That shows you how faint you can possibly see in terms of a star's brightness. And by doing that, you're measuring your light pollution level and in less than a minute, you can click that submit button and you're done. And this is that constellation we want you to look at, which is Orion for this month. And down the east coast there, you see a lot of the, the contributions that the brighter the dot, the brighter the sky, the darker the dot, the darker the sky. More than a quarter million people are sending in data on a regular basis. Nearly 2,000 miles away from Tucson, near Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, just a stone's throw from where Yerkes built his observatory, a small gathering of high school students are using more than their smartphones to help gather data for Globe at Night. They're building sensors to measure nighttime light levels. We're actually putting in poles here mm -hmm. so that we can put standoffs in. Kate Meredith is the president and director of GLASS, which is short for Geneva Lake Astrophysics and STEAM. The idea is eventually to surround the lake, have at least 20 of these deployed at equidistance around the lake so that we can get an idea about what, where are the impacts on our night sky from various sources. So we're going to take the sensor and we're going to walk beside the house here. In a second, we'll figure out who wants to do what. Students install the weatherproof devices outside the homes of property owners who have agreed to take part in the project. These sensors are connected to the Wi-Fi at each one of the properties and that at one in the morning, this data gets uploaded to a Google site. And then we're gonna be able to take those data and make graphs out of them, even make sonifications out of them, show uh, the data on a Google map. The information collected will also be fed into the data bank at the Noir Lab in Tucson. The goal is to advance science and raise community awareness about the problem of light pollution. Meredith says it does more than obscure the stars. We rely on darkness to trigger melatonin production and we're just beginning to know all the effects that a good melatonin production and good night's sleep has on human health. So adding it all up, what does all this data from around the world point to? With their data, they saw that there were fewer and fewer stars they could see on average from their location from year to year to year. It translates into about almost a 10% brightening every single year. So each year, the sky is getting 10% brighter on average around the world. And that's what we think is a very alarming rate. Based on the data gathered through Globe at Night, Noir Lab recently reported that due to growing light pollution, about 30% of people around the world and around 80% of people in the U.S. cannot look up at night and see our home galaxy, the Milky Way. There's a beauty to it that is unparalleled, and once you see it, you'll totally understand, and it'll be something you never forget. But there is a piece of ourselves that we are actually losing if we lose the night sky. It's a source of inspiration for our younger generation. 
At Great Lakes Now, we aim to cover the Great Lakes region and the people who live here, like you. Please follow us on social media, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and sign up for our newsletter at greatlakesnow.org. All right, so before we start unpacking everything that we just saw, I want to make sure that we drop a link to the landing page for our March episode, Fading Stars and River Bugs, into the chat so people can check that out after the watch party has wrapped up. I'm also really excited. We are getting some names and some people who are wanting to join the conversation. So let me just go through some of who we have tuning in right now. We've got Renee in Ypsilanti, Michigan. We have Cheryl in Tecumseh. We have Lee in Griffith, Indiana. We have Robert in New Berlin, Wisconsin. Potter, who is watching from Buffalo, New York. Rose Butler in Michigan. We have Tina in Michigan. Debbie in Ypsilanti Township in Michigan. Uh, Manny Paula, who is in Michigan. We have Robin, who's in Washington. Uh, we also have Tarika McDaniel, who says hi. Uh, Gerard Snell is tuned in. And Potter D says, I bet sensor kits like this could be sold as a subscription service. Two to four times a year, you receive a new sensor kit that you assemble and upkeep. There's tech nerds looking for home projects. I'm excited to get into that once we introduce our guests, because I know that uh, libraries are actually playing an interesting role in sort of the equipment Um the equipment needs that citizen science projects have from time to time. So we'll get into all that in just a moment. But I do want to mention that Great Lakes Now always has a lesson plan. And that lesson plan is based on segments from the monthly show. So if you're a parent wanting to help your kids learn more about the Great Lakes, or if you're a teacher looking for fun activities for your class, remember that each month you can find a new learning activity related to the show. For this month, we have one lesson that's going to focus on citizen science and have students learning about what science is, how they can take part in it. And then the other lesson is going to be climate focused, helping students to understand climate change and the impact that human activity can have on it. So be sure to take advantage of those lesson plans if that is something that you are interested in. And before we welcome our guests, I just want to remind you tuning in at home to let us know where you're watching from and also let us know if you've ever participated in citizen science. Do you have questions or comments about using an app, maybe a website, or teaming up with a local organization in your community? to uh, take a role in data collection and citizen science. Let us know, and I'll be sure to work all of that into the conversation. But first, let's welcome our guests. So first up, we have Darlene Cavalier, who's founder of online citizen science portal called SciStarter and a professor of practice at Arizona State University. Darlene, it's so great to have you with us. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Absolutely. And then we also have Dr. Connie Walker, who is a scientist with the National Science Foundation's Noir Lab, which is the U.S. National Center for Ground-Based Nighttime Optical Astronomy. Connie, it's great to have you with us. It's a real honor to be here, and thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. And Connie, we'll start with you, actually. So we saw you featured in that segment that we just saw. I'm wondering, though, you know, you run Globe at Night, which... I was actually a little bit, I was like, is it an app? Is it a website? So I'm going to let you sort of talk a little bit about what Globe at Night is and how you came to sort of be at the helm of managing this really cool citizen science project. Well, actually, I and, and some other people uh, at Noir Lab, which was called the National Observatory, the Optical, National Optical Astronomy Observatory in the past, um, we uh, actually got a chance to uh, create Globe at Night 17 years ago, almost to, to the day. And, uh, and we just we were um, working with kids that were down in one, at one of our observatory sites in Chile, namely near La Serena. And we we're working with uh, Spanish speaking students in Tucson, Arizona. We wanted them to meet each other and to really um, sort of take hold of a project that they really would you know, sink their teeth into and get interested in. And so we thought, well, maybe Globet, maybe uh, light pollution would be something we would do. So they each got out uh, the, the, you know, their, well, a map of their city and some colored push pins and looked, went outside to evaluate or rate the night sky brightness. And this caught the eye of a, an organization called GLOBE, which is a STEM education organization based in Boulder, Colorado. And they said they could put this online in three months and they did. It was amazing. And, it, and it, of course, it went international very, very wow. quickly. Yeah, it took off like wildfire. And it's been operating very successfully ever since. 
Very cool. And um, I know we have some images that were, some of them were featured in this segment. Some of them are things that you had sent over um, to me ahead of time. So I'm, all right. So this is the Globe at Night uh, website. And we should also say that we're going to put uh, the Noir Lab website and the Globe at Night page both into the chat for people who want to learn more, maybe participate in this. But talk us through what we're seeing here, Connie. Well, there you're seeing uh, the first two steps actually uh, have, can be done automatically with a smartphone. They're very easy to, to, uh, to do if you need to put it in, though. Uh, they translate it into a latitude and longitude and where you are on Earth. And then the third step there is basically you're choosing what, uh, what uh, well, how you rate the night sky. And each of those charts that you see in thumbnail uh, format there at the bottom. When you click on it, it shows the big picture and where you leave it is where your measurement is going to be and what you're looking for. You're not counting stars because if you had that kind of sky, you'd be there all night or all year. Uh, so you're just looking for the faintest star possible. And that's the one, whatever matches what the chart you see is where you leave it. And then the, the next thing down below uh, is you see the different, um, four different charts uh, for different uh, images of what the uh, weather could be. So either we we'll hope you take it in, in uh, clear weather and not in cloudy weather because it's not quite useful. But uh, but you want to be truthful in what you what you put in there, and that's all you need to do. You don't need to put in any comments. If you have a sky quality meter like the one I'm holding here, uh, that is like the meter that the Raspberry Pis that uh, they're working on at Glass. Uh, but this is something that is uh, bought from a company called Unihedron, and it does the same sort of thing. Uh, and it takes uh, measurements of the night sky, and you can also put that measurement in there. But you don't need to if you don't have it. Okay. And um, I'm wondering, you know, if somebody is interested in doing this, just in general, I mean, I'm in Detroit right now, and there's a lot of light pollution here. So I'm wondering, just based on your experience, about how long does it take average human eyes to adjust to the night sky? Um, and is there any sort of, you know, best practice involved when you are going outside, if you're participating in Globe at night, like, you're supposed to give your eyes, like, I don't know, five, 10 minutes to adjust or something before you go right. ahead and start, start on this project? Right. I mean, uh, in some cases, you, you're like, your city's already very light polluted, but um, normally you go out after maybe an hour after sunset or more uh, until about halfway through the night, because we usually pick nights that are don't have the moon out uh, in the first half of the evening, because that's the natural light bulb of the night sky. And then we all also try to take about uh, 10 minutes for younger people to adjust their eyes to the dark and maybe 15 minutes or a tiny bit more for people that are older because their eyes don't adjust as, as readily to the night sky brightness, uh, the night sky darkness. And uh, then you can, you can follow the steps that are on the web. It's actually a web page, but this web page actually um, can work on any browser and on any phone. And we're actually working, making them into apps next. That's our next step. Okay, very cool. Phones. So, Connie, yeah. I'm wondering, um, it sounds like this is something that people can get involved in anywhere because we have a question coming in from Lori Peterson um, who is wondering how can we get Lake Erie involved? And maybe this is like Lake Erie in general with citizen science, and I'll ask Darlene more about that, but I wanted to ask you first. So if, um, you know, they, if Lori lives along Lake Erie and is wanting to get involved in Globe at Night, is that something that, um, that Lori can do? And can anybody anywhere get involved in this? Anybody, anywhere. We don't take any registration. You just get on the, the web uh, page and you take the report page, actually, and you take data. It's um, app.globeatnight.org right away. And within a minute after you get your, your eyes adjusted to the dark, you'll have your measurements all done. And any observation you can take, it really does help us because we have found, as you saw recently, a very outstanding um, uh, conclusion that uh, the brightness is increasing much faster than we ever thought it was. So we have to try to, um, it's, a, it's a good alarm to set because we really need to try to all get gathered together and do something about this. Absolutely. And some of that some of that stares with the measurements yeah sure globeatnight.org is the place and we also yeah. have Kay who's tuned in from Canton Ohio we have Trevor who is saying that this is such an amazing app and it's really easy to use so there you have it. Well, thank um, all you. right. So Connie, sit tight for me just in case we have other questions come in about Globe at Night. But now I'm excited to welcome Darlene Cavalier into the conversation. Hi, Darlene. Hello. Nice to nice to see you again. Absolutely. So okay. 
We, it was funny because you and I actually, we had a conversation a few weeks back now, sort of talking about citizen science and you had mentioned globe at night. And I was like, yeah, that's actually going to be one of the focal points of the episode. But then you told me that there were so many other really incredible offerings that people can get involved in if there's an interest in citizen science. So I'm wondering before we get into some of those, you know, kind of briefly walk me through when and why you decided to start this initiative of SciStarter. It's a great question. I started SciStarter as a graduate student because I wanted to learn how regular people like me who don't have a formal science degree could actually get involved in science. Little did I know there were thousands of opportunities out there, but they were difficult to find. Um, back then, 2011, you kind of had to know to search for weird terms like participatory research and, and things that I certainly didn't know before I went to school to study this. So SciStarter was kind of the answer to that um, issue or that gap that existed. So I wanted to make it easier for people to find these opportunities to get involved. And here we are with thousands of projects. Each of them need help from the public. Sometimes a scientist doesn't have enough data. So Connie is a great example of that. She needs more data to advance research on light pollution and all of the outcomes that happen as a result of too much light pollution. Some scientists have too much data. They ask people to sort through and analyze data. So typically, these are the two ways that people get, get involved. You make and share observations like Globe at Night, or you analyze data. When there's too much data, you go online and you help analyze data. Interesting. Okay. So um, I also want to say for people who are, you know, looking in the chat for all of the links that we drop in throughout these watch parties, we'll be sure to put something in for SciStarter. If you are watching this and you're like, whoa, this is so cool. I want to learn more. Uh, we'll put that in the chat for you. But Darlene, going back to that question that we got from Potter D uh, just a few minutes ago about sensor kits that could be sold as a subscription service, that kind of makes me think about just the fact that, you know, sometimes in these citizen science projects, um, it's important that there are tools, and there are like physical things that people need to have to be able to do some of these projects, right? And that can be, sometimes I think based on my understanding, kind of where libraries can come in. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, about that. That's exactly right. SciStarter, our whole mission is to lower as many barriers as possible, making it easy for you to find the opportunities. And then along the way, what else is preventing somebody from getting involved? There's not a lot we can do about the number one reason people don't get involved, lack of time. So we do try to make things efficient so you can easily find things. So use the advanced search filter on SciStarter to find what you're looking for, including all kinds of projects you can do around Lake Erie. Right. Look for the local yeah. projects there. Yeah. And then Perfect. also one thing we found were sometimes most projects do not require any instruments. Connie mentioned um, a dark sky meter that's actually not required for the project, but it helps. It helps build confidence when you have additional data points you can enter. So some, some projects do require in instrumentation. That might be water quality sensors, air quality sensors. And so we work with Arizona State University and hundreds of libraries across the country to offer kits that you can check out from a local library, get involved in the project, and return the kit for the next person. So you'll find that on SciStarter.org forward slash library. If you're a librarian who's interested in being part of this, everything is available for you to just freely use, build a kit guides, everything that you need is there. And if you're a member of the public looking for a way to either get your local library involved or find a local library, you'll see a section on that site as well. It's really such a cool thing. I mean, I have to say, I didn't realize how robust um, the sort of network and community of citizen scientists, um, just sort of what, what exists around that in terms of the breadth and variety of projects. And honestly, just the level of enthusiasm that a lot of people have about being a part of the data collection and knowing that, um, you know, their work, which is also, it seems like um, a, a lot of kind of almost like legitimizing an excuse to like be outside, you know, Know, be engaging with the local ecosystem and then also um, having a hand in, you know, really important scientific data collection. And that sort of brings me into, you know, Sorry, I have my cat in the back. I hope oh, she's not too distracting. But, you know, so there are these projects where, you know, you need tools. They might be a little bit more specific. But then there are things that are really broad, really general, perfect sort of entry level places. And you talked with me about some of those um, in a conversation that we had that's also featured in the episode. But I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about some of those more popular ones, things like iNaturalist, Stream Selfie. Um, talk about a few of those. 
Stream selfie is a great one, especially for people who are affected by and live off the water near them. The water source is super simple project to get involved in through the Isaac Wal Walton League of America. And this is one where you, you, you are basically building a national map of all of the streams that exist. And these streams come and go. So it's important that people are actively involved in this. And what happens is you're identifying the quality of that stream to the best of your ability. Is there a lot of trash there? Was it safe for you to access the stream? Do you know if it's on private or public land? And when you take a picture of that stream called Stream Selfie, because you can put yourself in there too, if you'd like, mm -hmm. your phone picks up the location immediately. And so with your phone's location, the picture of the stream and a little bit more data, those researchers and scientists can get a better look at, you know what? We actually wanna invest in that person who shared that data. We'll provide instruments, we'll provide training if they'd like to be a longer term uh, person who gets involved in monitoring the quality of that water. So we love Stream Selfie because it allows for a very simple entry point. Girl Scouts love this project, but it also enables you to go further with it. Another reason Girl Scouts love it, they can get their bronze, silver, gold award for moving a little further. You mentioned iNaturalist. This is mm -hmm. a free app, highly recommend it. If you wanna just take pictures of nature around you, plants and animals, there's an AI component there that will help you identify what you're looking at but probably more importantly, you join a community of other nature enthusiasts and your data is used by scientists. You're not going to mess up any data. There's people who verify what you're looking at. I've learned so much by using the app. Mm -hmm. And also, it's just really nice to know that it's being used for science. And I also want a chance, by the way, it's Citizen Science Month, but so I don't want to forget that. It's a great excuse in April to get involved in citizen science. But Connie's project relates to something else that's happening about now or in a couple of weeks, the bird migrations that will be coming through many parts of um, the United States, billions of birds come through, millions of birds will die because of strikes against buildings. They get, they kind of get very confused, mainly because of all the lights that are left on. So measuring the light pollution can help identify where it's just too bright, but even just more than the nesting ha habit habits, Connie mentioned the migration path, Birds are dying. Millions of birds are dying because they run into buildings. Lights are on. Simple mitigation. Turn your lights off while the birds are migrating through. It's just for a couple of weeks in spring and happen, it happens again in fall. But that's a project through Audubon called Lights Out. That's another one worth looking at. Okay, cool. I really appreciate it. And some of these pro uh, some of these projects rather that you mentioned, these are what you told me are like their affiliate programs. So can you explain a little bit about what affiliate programs are within SciStarter and kind of like the in the citizen science ecosystem, why are affiliate programs significant? Super important. They're important for research because researchers use SciStarter to see how people are learning, which projects are not, you know, available for people, so where gaps exist and how people move through the ecosystem, how they deepen their learning. So for, for us researchers, that's really cool information to see. The It's also important because if you're an educator or you're a librarian or you're a Girl Scout troop leader, or we work with corporate volunteer programs, anybody that needs to actually help support and track the progress of people in their community as they move through projects, select affiliate projects. So you can you can go to SciStarter.org forward slash affiliate, or you can just use an affiliate feature uh, filter on the search tool on SciStarter. These are hundreds of projects, including Globe at Night, that use special digital tools called APIs that report back to SciStarter when a SciStarter member has contributed data to that project. So you get credit, and the credit is not reward, it's not redeemable for money, but we do give out certificates. Sometimes we have neat challenges, but it is a fun and very important way, especially if you need to show evidence that you've got involved in the project in order to get a grade or a Girl Scout badge. Definitely choose the affiliate projects. Cool. I would also say that like, even if you don't get money, you get cool cred, right? Like it feels kind of good to be able to show people that you were a part of a citizen science project. Uh, we also have Bonnie and Sophia tuning in from Gross Point, Michigan. And I want to bring Connie back into the conversation now and kind of close things out. I feel like I could talk, I mean, clearly there's so many robust offerings of citizen science, but to kind of wrap things up for us tonight, um, I kind of just want to ask both of you, based on your experiences, what is the best part of citizen 
citizen science and kind of speak to the benefits, the potential that can come from engaging regular people in this work. Connie, I'll start with you. Uh, I, I think that the one of the best parts uh, of citizen science is providing the opportunities uh, to bring the awareness to the public on you know critical issues like light pollution and other uh, other things that um, that uh, Darlene has mentioned, and for the public then because they want to they, they want to provide their contributions to science um, and through the crowdsourcing that we are able to do with citizen science because no one scientist can uh, you know can be everywhere taking data all of the time during the year. So uh, citizen scientists are very, very vital to ensuring that data is taken from as much of the earth as possible and as often as possible to monitor um, how worse or how, how or in some cases how much better something like the levels of light pollution become over the years. So citizen science, um, at least in the case of Globe at Night and I think in many other cases as well, they provide the opportunity for citizens uh, to be good stewards of the mm. earth. Absolutely. That's sort of, I think, what I was intuiting um, as I was, you know, kind of thinking what the answer to that question might be, is that it seems like it sort of ups the ante in terms of people getting um, more engaged with and more invested in yeah. the, the natural world around them. Um, Darlene, I'm curious from your view, you've been involved in this work for so long. What do you think is the coolest or most special part of citizen science? Well, building on what Connie said, um, you know, everybody knows something, nobody knows everything. That's basically the premise of citizen science. And by working together, you'll learn a lot. But what makes this different than a typical STEM program, science, technology, engineering, and math, is while those are designed for learning, in citizen science, you make observations, but you share them. And if you don't share your observations, it's not citizen science. So not only are you learning, but you're advancing pretty important research. Another important component to remember is that if you're not sharing data locally, your data is not counted. So you want to be counted. This is for environmental health projects, but also for human health projects. And you'll see a lot of those in SciStarter too. You want things that are going to affect you. You kind of need to be in on the action and supporting the projects by entering data. Your observations that are local have a way of coming back to benefit you by being involved in these projects. Okay, cool. And before we wrap up, we do have one last question that came in from Trevor, who's asking, are there any trainings for someone who is new to citizen science? Darlene, mm -hmm. I imagine you probably have the answer. Yes, definitely. SciStarter.org forward slash training. You'll see a series of free online self-guided trainings, and I highly recommend starting with the foundations of citizen science. It comes with slides and talking points if you want to also do the training and then help others. Um, just discover the wonderful world of um, citizen science. Awesome. Cool. All right, Trevor. Well, hopefully that helps you out. And um, thank you both so much. So we have Darlene Cavalier, who's founder of the online citizen science portal SciStarter, also a professor of practice at Arizona State University. And we have Dr. Connie Walker, who's a scientist with the National Science Foundation's Noir Lab, which is the U.S. National Center for Ground-Based Nighttime Optical Astronomy. Thank you both so much for joining the watch party. It was great to have you. Thank you so much for letting us be a part of it. Absolutely. Happy Citizen Science Month. Yeah, yes. that's right. Go out there with a fervor now for April. <laughs> Citizen Science all the way. Also, yeah. a big thank you to our co-hosts for this watch party. And we have a map that we can pull up. Uh, well, I thank everybody because it is a lot of organizations. We have Detroit Public Television. We have WNMU TV, PBS in Marquette, Michigan. We have WQLN in Erie, Pennsylvania. PBS Western Reserve in Kent, Ohio. WPBS TV in Watertown, New York. Milwaukee PBS. WNIT Michiana PBS in South Bend, Indiana, WBGU PBS in Bowling Green, Ohio, the Michigan Learning Channel, the Belle Isle Nature Center, Circle of Blue, Planet Detroit, and also two of our panelists tonight co-streamed this live event, SciStarter and Noir Lab. We've also been streaming on our Great Lakes Now YouTube channel. And we also have uh, Robin, we've got one more comment coming in from Robin saying the online training is a great way to get started in citizen science. So keep that in mind if you are interested. I also want to thank our wonderful team at Detroit Public Television. We have Tammy Winsell, Colleen O'Donnell, Mila Murray, Jordan Wingrove, Bill Allisey, Rob Green, Greg King, and Lana Contardi. Thank you so much for tuning in for another Great Lakes Now episode sneak peek watch party. And until next time, we'll see you out on the lakes.